A couple of weeks ago, I was having a conversation with a friend, and he told me about this company called Tabs Chocolate. And this company has grown from zero to over $10 million in revenue in just about 18 months. And the way they did it was really interesting. They leveraged TikTok, which uh, many uh, UGC brands do or CPG products do, but they did it in a slightly different way. In the beginning, they reached out to influencers like a lot of companies do and tried to get them to promote their company uh, using their, their own personal accounts. But they figured out pretty quickly that this was very inefficient. They would have to send, you know, 100 DMs to these people to get a tiny fraction of them to respond. Many of them would respond with numbers that were not going to be cost effective for them in terms of the ROI they were going to get. And understandably, these influencers would only post about them once or twice because uh, they didn't want their uh, accounts just to become these accounts that would kind of shill this company's products. And so uh, it was a very inefficient way of doing things. And so they stumbled upon a different approach. Uh, instead of reaching out to influencers, they decided to grow their own influencers. And what they did is they found creators who were good at creating content that would go viral. And they reached out to them and said, I would like you to stand up a new account uh, using some derivation of our company's name. And you use our company's branding. And I want you to create 30 TikToks, one a day, and just test stuff and just see what works. And you have full creative control, very rough guidelines around what was, in a, you know, not doing something super inappropriate, but generally speaking, you have free reign. And what ended up happening is now they have all of these accounts with all of these influencers who are creating content aggressively for their brand, finding out what works. Once they find a winner, they download it and share it with all of the other creators in their little network of, of, of creators who are posting on their behalf. And as a result, they've generated millions and millions and millions of views for their brand and more importantly, a bunch of sales. And the, they, they did another sneaky thing too, where when somebody views their posts or asks a comment about, uh, asks a question about their product, they can create a follow-up TikTok and that gets automatically targeted to all of the people who viewed or engaged with the first one. And so it's effectively free retargeting. And I'm telling you this story because they this is a company that did not exist 18 months ago. And today, like I said, generates $10 million plus in revenue per year. And they did it on the back of, a pla of one platform and with two tactics, basically. Two very specific tactical decisions had a overwhelming impact on the results of their company. This matters because I get into a lot of conversations with people and they talk about the idea that tactics don't matter and that what you should focus on is strategy. And in my opinion, I think that is a false dichotomy. I think that yes, you should have a strategy and there is such a thing as a good strategy and a bad strategy. But I also think that the tactics matter quite a bit. And I've seen this play out in uh, my own experience. We invested in a company years ago that was basically white label social networks on mobile. And this was back in the day when Facebook had just announced Facebook app installs. And our team is pretty aggressive in terms of testing different approaches. And they found an ad with the right targeting and the right creative in, in the Facebook ad unit that was allowing them to drive Facebook app installs for something like 50 cents per, which if you've had any experience um, trying to do acquisition for mobile apps, that number is mind boggling. And it was very, it was, a, they, they had tested hundreds and hundreds of ads. And this one particular ad was by far the most effective at doing this. David Ogilvy, the famous ad man uh, who started the Ogilvy uh, ad agency, uh, talked about the importance of headlines. And he said that, you know, it's not uncommon for you to find an ad that will have an eight times or 10 times result because of the headline. And in fact, he said, when you've written the headline, you've spent 80 cents out of your dollar. There are very specific word choices that you can use in a headline. There are very specific uh, psychological triggers that you can leverage with your headline that will have a dramatic impact on the effectiveness of the, the result of that. And you've probably seen this yourself. If you're scrolling through your social feed, there are certain posts that you click on. There are certain ads that you click on that just kind of get you to stop in your tracks. And I'm willing to bet that those there is a smart marketer behind them who has tested a whole bunch of different approaches and has found the one that worked the best for you. In my class at Kellogg, uh, one of the exercises that I had the students do is create what we call a growth model. And a growth model 
basically takes all of the different levers in, in your product. So starting with acquisition, how many people view your ad? How many people click on your ad? Of the people that click on your ad, what percentage of them actually sign up? Of the people that sign up, what percentage of them have a good onboarding experience and engage in the core experience of your product? Of those that have a good initial experience, how many of them come back and bake this into their lives in a more consistent way? Of those, what percentage of them uh, refer other people. When they refer other people, what channel do they use? What's the messaging that they use? How many people does it get exposed to? What percentage of people click on that and what percentage of people sign up from that uh, invitation? All of those are variables that lead to a bottom line number in terms of your active users or number of customers or whatever it is. And all of those are manipulatable. And each one of those will be more or less effective based on very specific tactics. When we would go into innovation consulting groups uh, and we would talk to them about uh, ideas they were exploring or we would propose ideas to them, uh, it was very common for them to say, oh, we tried that and it didn't work. And I would always probe and say, you know, what do you mean didn't work, right? There are tons and tons of micro decisions that you can make around a product or a service that will determine whether or not it succeeds or not. And uh, very often they didn't, they didn't think that way. And so... Uh, as a result, they would build products based on a strategy without a ne necessarily having a nuanced understanding of the tactics that will make that strategy most likely to be effective. And so as a result, uh, they would experience subpar results. And their conclusion was that, oh, that's a bad idea. And it's not necessarily a bad idea. It very likely was poor execution. All of those are examples just to kind of draw attention to the fact that I actually think tactics matter a ton. Uh, now, that does not mean, I mentioned it's a false dichotomy, that does not mean that strategy doesn't matter, that does not mean that process doesn't matter, right? One of the things I've also found with tactics is that, especially from a marketing perspective, tactics tend to be pretty short-lived. As you find uh, a tactic that works, uh, people will discover it and more brands will use it, more companies will use it. And at the same time, the people that you are selling to will start to recognize it and start to ignore it. There's a term for this in advertising called banner blindness. Uh, back in the day when the first banner ad came out, the click-through rate on it was something like 72%, which is insane. Uh, so seven out of 10 people that saw that banner ad clicked on it. Now, fast forward to today, uh, your brain literally has been trained to, if it sees a you know 720 by 60 graphic image at the top of a page, if it sees a 300 by 300 square on the sidebar of a page, your brain has been trained to just ignore those things because it knows those are ads and it knows that it can ignore them. But in the beginning, when they first came out, they were very, very effective. The same thing is true like with sales prospecting. For a while there, there was this tactic with sending cold prospecting emails with a subject line of quick question. And people found that quick question was the most effective at generating a open, uh, positive open rate and a reasonable response rate. And so everybody started using it. And it's very likely you've been prospected with an email that had quick question in the subject line. And so you probably have become blind to it and realized that that's probably somebody trying to sell you something. And so you now ignore it. The point is that tactics are short lived, but that does not mean that the tactics don't matter. That doesn't mean ignore tactics. It's It's because I think what ends up happening is that a lot of people end up not becoming a student of tactics because they think that tactics don't matter. And so what they end up doing is they end up just doing a bunch of ineffective things. And they maybe have a good process, but because they're not a student of tactics, uh, they end up experiencing subpar results. And so the answer is to do both. Have a clear strategy at the top. Have a process for consistently testing different approaches and finding uh, winning tactics doubling down on the ones that work, obviously using data as your guide. And when it stops working, you switch tactics, right? But you always become a student of this. And so how do you go about doing that? One is you, like I said, become a student. And so for me, that looks like a bunch of things. From a product perspective, there are, there are sites like Product Hunt, uh, where I will go, uh, you know, once a week or once every couple of weeks, I'll go and look at the top products that were upvoted the most in any particular period of time. And I will often download them and I will study them. I'll look at what did they do when the screen first loaded? What did their onboarding process look like? The onboarding process in an app generally has a disproportionate impact on the ultimate uh, activation rate and the ultimate uh, lifetime value of a customer. And so onboarding matters a ton. And so what are the approaches that they use to 
gently onboard you to get the light bulb to kind of go on on your head that this is a cool product to get you to experience the core experience of the product. How do they handle notifications? We know that with a mobile app, if I can get you to enable notifications, your retention rate is likely to be quite a bit higher because I get to now ping you uh, to help you build that habit of using my product, right? And so how do they go about doing that? And I take notes on all of those things and I keep them in a notebook. It doesn't have to be a physical notebook. It can be Evernote or Notion or whatever it is. But the point is, is you, you create a library of tactics that you have seen be effective in other areas uh, so that you have a ready-made uh, library of things that you can try when it's time to do the same in your business. The same thing from a copywriting perspective. Um, advertisers for a long time and copywriters have kept what they call swipe files. When they see examples of great copywriting, when they see examples of a great ad, they will clip it out or save it to a notebook and now they have a library of ads that used certain types of headlines or certain types of creative execution to great effect that they can then leverage when they're trying to execute their own campaigns. And so I do the same thing. I keep a swipe file. Whenever I find myself scrolling Instagram or scrolling on Twitter or when I find myself opening an email that I received, take an extra second and ask yourself, why did this work? Uh, was it the headline that got me to click? What was it about the headline that got me to click? Maybe they are using some scarcity tactic, or maybe they used numbers. We often find that using very specific numbers works better than, than other types of approaches. Um, odd numbers, for whatever reason, often work better than even numbers. You become a student of these things, you save them in a notebook so that you can refer back to them later on, and then when it's time to do your own execution, you run a series of tests and you see what works. You create a hypothesis, you say, I'm gonna try these five different approaches to this headline. You run a test, you see which ones work, you make sure that you can track, actually track the results in terms of open rate, click-through rate, uh, install rate, response rate, whatever it is, whatever the metric is that you're trying to manipulate. You run a bunch of tests using the inspiration from your swipe files as a starting place. And then when you find one that works, you then allocate the bulk of your resources toward that. Uh, and often we talk about you know spending 80% of your budget or 80% of your emails or whatever it is toward strategies that you have found to be effective. And then you spend 20% of that budget or 20% of those resources uh, test continuing to test new things because you might find, you still might find ones that work better. Uh, you need to have a backup for when that one starts to wane in its effectiveness. Again, as people become, uh, you know, banner blind to a new creative execution or a new approach or a new type of ad unit or whatever it is, you need to have a process for finding that next winner. Again, that does not mean that you don't become a student of winner of winning tactics. It just means that you have a process for deploying them and then a process for iterating around them and then a process for replacing them with new tactics when the original one stops to work. So I hope you find that helpful. Strategy is super important, but tactics are super important as well. And having a process for systematically testing tactics is incredibly important. So when someone tells you that tactics don't matter, focus on strategy, I want you to be a little bit skeptical because odds are the last thing that you bought, the last product that you consumed, the company behind that leveraged some very specific tactics in a very creative way uh, to get you to sign up and to raise your hand.